couple more lo um, loading. So. Okay, that's fine. Just an FYI, I tried to just enter the meeting code ID, but then I asked for a password and there was no password anywhere. So couldn't go in that way, just to let you know. Okay. Just sure if you have, because in the list it says it enter the meeting code and I- Good Morning, Chris. Morning. Okay. Morning. All right, we're recording. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, another Tuesday morning, and uh, just as a reminder, we do record these and uh, certainly outtakes, and sometimes uh, we will be able to post the entire uh, morning session. So uh, just be aware of that as we get into comments. This, uh, this uh, week's CEO hour is a little different because we're doing um, a double header and it's uh, really interesting. We have two business leaders uh, joining us this morning, uh, representing a segment of the food industry. The food industry is uh, pretty robust on the uh, South Shore, actually everywhere, uh, but we, we uh, enjoy that uh, diversity and strength of the industry. Um, here. Did I just lose the video? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so we have got Courtney Doyle from Clan, uh, Clandestine Kitchens and Annie Powell from KLP Specialties joining us. And we're going to try to hit uh, quite a few points um, in this morning's show. Uh, so it'll be a little uh, uh, different and uh, Busy, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, starting a new business during an economic downturn. Um, how you adapt an existing business uh, during this downturn, as we've been seeing people uh, doing. We want to talk a little bit about the food industry generally on the uh, the South Shore and what that looks like. I want to talk a little bit about uh, health care. Uh, food is a critical part of uh, health care. And we want to discuss uh, a little bit about uh, what's happening with people out there. As I mentioned uh, to our guests just before we started, you know, I'm puzzled as to why some people are successfully losing weight during this. And then there are people like me who are gaining weight uh, when we're not going out uh, as much. And uh, I'm sure it has a lot to do with diet and eating habits, but uh, maybe get into that. So before we get into all of those issues, uh, let me ask each of our guests to introduce themselves, because we like to find out a little bit about the business leaders uh, during these. Uh, we think personality and background and um, the individual strengths that a business leader brings to something. Uh, to it to an enterprise is uh, as important as the business model. So, uh, Courtney, let me start with you. If you could um, uh, take a few minutes to tell us about yourself and and your background and how you got into this. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Doyle, and I founded Clandestine Kitchen. Uh, Clandestine Kitchen in January 2018. So we didn't. I didn't found the company during these times, but we've certainly had to make some adjustments and pivot a bunch. Um, even though you know, we were being deemed an essential business, we did take some time off to just reevaluate because, um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there's definitely been a lot of changes during this time throughout the food industry, um, even as far as our organic purveyors and farmers and where we source our products. So everything from the ground up, really, including our you know, meal prep, bringing our staff back, and our home delivery service. So we, uh, our bread and butter of our business is home meal delivery and corporate meal delivery. We actually had, um, we've got over 500 families on the South Shore right now partaking in our home meal delivery program. Um, we had about a third more prior to COVID. Um, so we're working on slowly rebuilding that after fall. So we added some, uh, a refrigerated delivery van over this time period, we were able to do that um, through the support of our clients and our community too, so that's been one positive, really exciting thing that we're able to really ramp up this fall as more of our clients now are comfortable coming back, or at least trying to get into some kind of routine, um, whatever that looks like for the fall. So I live in Hingham. I have three kids that are in Hingham High School and Hingham Middle School. Um, 
everyone who works for me just coincidentally has kids too. So that's been another little challenge to juggle, um, especially during summertime and now looking ahead into what school's going to look like in the fall. Um, so even from an employment staffing perspective, we've had to make some adjustments and changes into how you know our business plan looks and how our future growth looks as we head into just these more uncertain times. Um, but I have a background in marketing and communications also. I'm a self-taught chef, so I did not go to culinary school. I just self-taught myself, and my passion is on healthy eating, clean eating. So for me, I worked at William Sonoma Corporate in San Francisco 15 years ago, 16 years ago, um, and had full access to the test kitchen, to Chef Williams as he was writing recipes, and it was a huge source of in inspiration for me to really learn how to take organic, local, seasonal ingredients and turn them into something amazing, and really to try to eat that way so that we're supporting our local communities and local agriculture too. Um, you know, supporting our local farms is really important, and we try to do that as much as we possibly can, including supporting other small businesses. We do a lot of work with um, smaller companies like Duxbury Salt Works is the salt we use in the kitchen. Um, Nectar and Green Almond Milk we source from Boston to you know, be our almond milk provider. So all of the ingredients that we use, we try to source as locally as possible. So that's one of our passions too. In addition to our home and corporate meal delivery, we also have a website and a health and wellness blog. And we've collected in what we consider local industry leaders to be our wellness editors. So that you know, we speak to some of our, we share our recipes, um, I'll speak to you know, food and the combination of just healthy living and wellness in general, but then we now have this team of experts that we've had for the last year and a half who contribute blog articles specific to their industries, whether that's fitness, style, uh, travel, community service. To us, health and wellness is a more of a whole body being. It's not just about food. It's not just about eating. It's whatever makes you feel happy and makes you feel well. So for some people, that's fashion is their passion. And so we've got two great editors who are bloggers, um, local bloggers who help us with that. And they really focus on supporting local. So supporting whatever is in season in local boutiques, um, you know, things that you can find just walking down the street or now, of course, online shopping and curbside pickup. We also, during this time, have really taken, um, we're members of Eat South Shore with, that Heather runs. And so we have taken upon ourselves to really try to include our whole community. I have a lot of friends that own restaurants in the area. And during this time, we're thriving at Clandestine Kitchen. They are not. And so for us to try to help spread the word, spread awareness about their menus, about how they're navigating during this time, how you can still continue to support our local restaurants so that they're still there on the other side of this. Um, that's been really important to us too. So we've been you know, getting guest recipe posts from some local chefs. Um, we're part of the Eat South Shore Summer Passport, sponsoring the gift cards for folks who are dining and posting and sharing and just trying to spread the word about our local restaurants too. Um, so there's that community aspect of it that we feel is important for our brand. And finally, uh, the big piece and a piece that's really close to my heart, and I'm hoping to parlay this into hopefully starting our own um, nonprofit arm too, is the community giving. So every once in a while, usually once a quarter, sometimes more. Right now, I feel like we're doing it every week. Um, we try to designate a pop-up delivery that we do or some sort of offering into supporting a local uh, nonprofit community organization. So just this past Friday, we did a pop-up for the Magical Moon Farm and Magical Moon Foundation in Marshfield. Donna Green, who's the founder of that organization, um, they're just struggling big time because they can't do any of their events or fundraisers or auctions. So we were actually able to, we partnered with Ralph's Kingham Wine Merchant, um, Aldous Collins and Everybody Water and put together some awesome cooler packages that uh, clients and community members were able to pre-order and we ended up raising over $4,000 for them on Friday. So those are the kinds of things to us that if we're able to have our full staff back to be able to continue to provide clean, healthy eating, and our motto is everything in moderation, you know, you don't have to be perfect all the time. So we do delivery one day a week to our clients. Stock your fridge with healthy grain bowls, snacks, smoothies, things like that so you have them at your disposal, especially since a lot of people are working from home and doing this all the time, um, just to have healthy things to grab. But that doesn't mean that 
you, know, you exclusively have to just eat completely clean to be considered healthy. Um, so that's sort of our mission too, is you know, really trying to get out there. And you know, we do take out once a week at home. Um, we eat our own meals all the time. Um, so just trying to really say, hey, our community has a ton of resources for health and wellness and let's just use them all. Sorry, I'm not hearing Peter, anybody. you're muted. Okay, I can hear you now. All right. Okay, Annie, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, yourself, and in the, in the business. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Courtney, that is such an amazing story and big shoes to follow. Um, my name is Annie Powell, and the, our company is KLP Specialties. It's actually my sister's company. Um, traditionally, she is a uh, provider of culinary herbs to large wholesalers in New England and across the country. She has an herb farm in Antioquia, Colombia, that um, she flies product from daily. And um, that business went sideways in March. And um, we were struggling to get groceries. Um, we each only have one child and in, you know, April we were getting, we ended up with two deliveries or, or a pickup from Roach Brothers and a delivery from Whole Foods on the same day. The end to end process was taking 10 days to two weeks. Um, and we just thought, you know what, let's, let's take a shot at trying to provide consistency, both in terms of timing for folks, as well as product and price. And what we did was we sourced local partners to help us in that mission. What started out as kind of a lark um, has taken off. Um, so what we did was we uh, decided that we would have designated days where folks could pick up their orders. Um, we have several local partners, uh, Iggy's Bread in Cambridge is um, probably one of our most famous partners and the most delicious. Um, we have a fourth generation butcher, um, uh, Carlo Crosetti. He owns an operation called uh, Oakdale Farms and um, he's got amazing marinated meats and a whole myriad of, of products. Um, we hope to be able to carry beyond the marinated meats in the coming months. Um, we're just not sure this, how long this is gonna last. Um, we have local farms that we uh, source from, as well as local um, uh, cheeses, uh, eggs, um, all, all sorts of products. So this was really born out of uh, trying to figure out a better way for people, and it's taken off. So that's it, in a quick, quick nutshell. We're still early days. We opened up... Um, our first week was the third week in April. So we're, we're still trying to find our way, if you will. So tell, tell me about uh, what happened in March, obviously the pandemic, but was there a problem with supply chain and herbs from Colombia? Uh, um, no, 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 no. That, so that she provides to wholesalers who then provide to restaurants, hotels, and caterers, chefs. Uh -huh. And so with everything shutting down, um, we realized she's got a beautiful facility right down the street from the chamber's office in Rockland. It's a 3000 square foot refrigerated space. And we realized we had capacity to do something different at that time. Um, so I should also mention, I have a background in media and technology. I was in radio for a long time in Boston uh, sales manager at 105.7 FM WRR, and then went on to uh, focus on uh, technologies to support small businesses. I was at Constant Contact early days and uh, did a couple of other things. Um, I'm also part of a startup podcast company called Mudhouse Media, uh, locally based, but we've got some very cool podcasts that we bring to market. So it's a little busy. Um, but the food art business is, is really um, a wonderful challenge for us. And if we, it's, it, to echo Courtney's sentiments around community, it's really about serving community. And we've met some awesome new friends um, through, through this endeavor. So. 
So let, let me ask about supply chain for both of you, uh, be, because you, um, Annie, you were doing it long distance and are sourcing from other areas. Courtney, you're trying to focus on local producers. Um, has, has your supply chain been stretched or uh, changed at all for, for either of you during this and in what way? Courtney, go ahead. Um, so for Courtney, us, you have to lean into your uh, into the mic a little. I, I was telling Peter, I'm in the kitchen every day. I don't do the Zoom thing, so feel free to send instructions. <laughs> uh, so we our supply chain for the most part. Um, right when COVID crisis hit, we definitely noticed we were getting. You know, we, we source a lot of our, say, um, bulk spices, for example, from Reinhardt Food Services. So anything that's, you know, a longer lasting shelf item that we can use. Um, some of our, like, you know, sponges and cleaners and things like that. Um, we were getting emails from them. And then Katsurubis, who's our organic produce purve purveyor, when we're not using farms directly. Um, everybody kind of sending communication saying, hold up, all your local delivery schedules are not happening anymore, stay tuned, we'll let you know. Which is a very challenging thing for us because we get fresh deliveries every day. We prepare everything fresh in our kitchen every morning for delivery in the afternoon. So for us not to have dependable, reliable deliveries or a last minute, hey, can I sub this non-organic for the organic that you said you were providing to your clients, it doesn't work for us. So it made the most sense for us to just shut down. We shut down for three and a half weeks um, during that month of March. And it actually was great. It was stressful for us. We were able to create a few other things, which I'll talk about in a minute, but to answer your question, it gave the suppliers a chance to sort of figure things out and to give us a chance to work with them behind the scenes to reemerge with our meal delivery on what we could depend on. So it actually worked out great to just take a step back for a few weeks um, and just reassess what the situation was but the local farms you know they're experiencing a huge hit and so for us it's really important we specifically support there's a farm out in Hanson garden to garnish farm chef Tina Conti actually works uh, for Kate's table in Hingham Kate Papaglioni is a really good friend of mine so sharing resources that way um, they're awesome and trying to, to support local farms um, Holly Hill and Cohasset for example whenever we can because their farmers markets their farm stands their presence at farmers markets has been seriously diminished so just for them trying to move their products as they're harvesting has been hard um, so for us I suppose in a roundabout way it worked out well for our business because there's more available to us um, and we're happy to take it and so I guess in that in that sense, it really helped us support local more, but there was definitely some issues with trying to get food. And we had clients all the time. I was just telling Annie, we spoke offline yesterday, um, that you know, Katsurubis, who's one of the local produce delivery companies here, started doing produce boxes and our clients were clamoring for them. You know, everybody was clamoring, how do I get fresh produce? Because supermarket shelves are completely picked over. Um, so we were seeing a lot of that too. We sell partner products every week. So we'll feature, um, we work with Blenda Babes, who's a local organic smoothie company um, that does frozen ready to blend smoothies. I mentioned Nectar and Green, the almond milk, Taza Chocolate. There's a bunch of local companies that we said, hey guys, we'll help you move your product and just include it in deliveries for our clients. And our clients loved it because they could get everything delivered to their door from various vendors, um, including our food. So, you know, we've been trying to do a little bit more of that too, just to all work together and help each other out. Annie, what about KLP and supply chain issues and then getting back to sort of the customer distribution since that model was changing? Right, right. So uh, we experienced a lot of what Courtney talked about, um, in particular the local farmers with the uh, farmers market shift um, were worried and, and, and ended up with a lot more product on their hands than they, they had places to give it to. Um, we work with Soli Homestead in um, uh, Middleborough. Um, and, um, you know, th for those guys, they have a specific window of opportunity in this corner of the country. So um, it's been a difficult time for sure. Um, um, the herb business 
has come back. So what Courtney said is 100% accurate uh, because Katsurubis is a customer of ours on the herb side. Um, and they basically went down to very few days of distribution during that period of time, along with the rest of the market. Um, and they are now coming back. So that business, um, we'll see what happens as uh, the colder weather impacts restaurant, uh, outdoor seating in particular. Um, but right now that business has picked back up. Um, in terms of uh, getting product from other areas of the country, uh, other produce, um, that has been a difficult thing to manage. So um, uh, California is a big provider uh, as well as Florida and just logistics of um, meeting the supply versus the demand has been uh, very difficult for every, every aspect from the farmer to the trucking company to where it's gonna go across the country. So the, the whole country has been impacted by this on um, a grand scale. Um, when things are reopening and then they have to close back down again has created a lot of disruption. And um, for, for the smaller restaurants, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare, um, just in terms of trying to manage their food inventory, um, their food costs, and right now, if they get a if they get a rainy or a cold night, you know they're in terrible trouble. So we really need to be supporting them um, all the way around. So, as we get, stay in this a little longer than any of us expected, we would have to. Uh, everyone is trying to figure out what are the permanent changes. What is fundamentally going to change about our own business organization because of this? Um, all for the better. Uh, your, your two companies, uh, what long range permanent change do you see to your business model as a result of what we're going through and uh, the redirection you've taken? Um, one thing, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna, I just wanna answer. Um, one thing that we learned early on is people don't want um, product from grocery stores that have been sitting on inventory. I think that's been the success of, or the of why we've gotten such a warm reception in the market is the notion of um, putting in an order, having it sourced and assembled and ready for pickup right away has been um, key to our success. Um, that was a byproduct. We honestly didn't conceive of that notion of stocking actual product versus sourcing and redistributing almost instantaneously. So I see that and that the feedback from the community has been that, that they would they want to continue to, to use the service because of that. Yeah. I would say also too, for us, you know, we had, we've got our goals, our you know, two year, five year, all of that, which has had to be a little bit um, redesigned during all this, but some things that have come out of it. So right before, the pandemic started, we were actually doing in-person pop-ups on Fridays. So for the most part, we're like in our little commercial kitchen, sorry, am I leaning in enough? Um, in our little commercial kitchen in Duxbury, just you know, by ourselves, we don't come in contact with our clients at all, except via email or you know, just answering questions or taking orders. So we thought this would be a great way to be able to get out and you know, see the people. And it was awesome. But now then doing anything in person for us, I mean, just, we're being, we're all committed to being extra vigilant in our own personal lives. And then the safety measures that we've implemented in the kitchen, as far as, you know, we do temperature checks every morning for everybody. Everyone voluntarily does that. Um, you know, it's new gloves for absolutely every task all the time. Um, every it's washed uniforms all the time, every day. Um, it's all these different protocols in the kitchen where we were already doing them for the most part, but it's just the heightened sensitivity to it and including exposure to, outside individuals. So for us, I don't see us reinstating pop-ups anytime soon. Um, just kind of keeping our little world in the kitchen so that we can be as safe as possible in creating our meals and then no contact delivering them to our clients. I think that's been one of our main selling points, to be honest with our business, is that that's what we do. We have delivery team that is gloved and masked and no contact delivery 
orders are placed online, payment is done online, there's absolutely no exchange of anything. And I think that that's been a, a very successful model for us, especially during this time. Our corporate meals, we had originally started to do more family style. We were actually catering for the um, studio department at Talbot's. And it was great. We were doing these awesome family meals for all their talent and staff. Um, but now that we've had this happen and a lot of our corporate clients aren't even back to work yet, um, we've got requests, we've had requests for individually packaged meals, which is exactly how we do them for home. So now instead of having a different model for corporate, it's looking very similar to how our home meal deliveries are packaged and delivered as well. So that's a little bit of a shift for us. During the time that we shut down in March, we actually accelerated big time the launch of our CK recipe box. So now we have a subscription program. It's um, so you can either do a $6.99 a month or just pay at a discount for the year, which then you have full access to all of our recipes. So it's a lot of our exclusive recipes that we actually use for delivery, plus a lot of sourced recipes from other nutritionists and chefs um, around here locally and just across the country. And then we also add in just inspiration for kids too. So while kids are at home, we have a whole CK Kids Cooking Club where they can go on. We have a separate section for them that are kid-friendly recipes. And if they make 10 or more, we deliver to them one of our favorite cookbooks. That's, you know, we read a little note to them and have them keep it. Um, so there's been a lot of awesome feedback on that too, just for something positive for kids to do and for the family to do. And just kind of to encourage people to eat healthy at home. Um, we have all healthy recipes up there. So at least it gives a source for folks to go to. So those are just some of the ways that we've been, you know, changing our business model and, and the things that have been successful for us right now. So with, with both of you, as we, uh, as you discuss the business, I think a lot of people when they, they think of sort of boutique food services, see it as um, somewhat uh, self-limiting in, in size and, and uh, scale, but it really isn't. You could take almost any business model and um, scale it to some degree. What are the limits on your abilities in both companies to scale the business and expand it? What are your five-year business plans? And is scaling um, a, a major part of your business plan or are you afraid you're gonna lose some of the unique value uh, that you can have with what you're doing now? Uh, well, Annie, do you want me to go? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, we, for right now, uh, my belief and what we've been just completely committed to from day one, we're totally self-funded. So we've been able to purchase our own commercial kitchen, purchase our own refrigerated delivery van um, without having to take out any business loans or anything. So we've been really careful about building this from the ground up um, without taking on a lot of debt. And so right now we don't have any, which is amazing. We're able to operate um, fully without having to do that. So that's my goal right now is to keep that going, just to add on and make the blueprint for location number one and get this hammered out for how this is gonna look as things shift as we move forward and move hopefully out of this sooner rather than later. Um, but to get this blueprint right, you know, originally I was hoping to open our second location in early 2021, but right now what I'd rather do is focus on growing the location that we have, adding to our delivery fleet, being able to reach uh, broader locations with refrigerated delivery vans, that's absolutely possible, running out of one commercial kitchen location. I think this is a highly, um, we'll be able to replicate this business, no problem, but we have to do it the smart way and have to do it the slow way. And that's how we've done it for the last two and a half years. It's just really trying to grow slowly and incrementally and really create this successful blueprint plan that we can replicate as we move to other towns and other locations. We get requests all the time to go North Shore, to go Cape, to go you know, um, West Metro West, even in the city. Um, but for right now, to me, this is still my baby. And, you know, we have eight staff members, nine staff members now. Um, and we're just still kind of keeping it close while we hammer out all these details, both for the home meal delivery, corporate meal delivery on the kitchen, but also for the brand as a whole with our presence online, you know, with our website and our blog, um, social media included, just really trying to, I want our company and our brand to be community focused and community rooted wherever those additional locations may be. So it's just trying to figure out how to do that. It's easy for me and hang on, I live here with three kids, you know, like automatically just into everything. Um, it's been interesting now that we've been in Duxbury with our commercial kitchen location because I didn't know anyone in Duxbury or know anything about Duxbury, but we're able to now 
successfully become involved in the community and really it does feel almost like a second home already so i'm confident that we'll be able to do that in other locations in the future good so courtney i don't want you to do divulge the location, otherwise Jay Nuss will get in there and buy up the neighborhood on you. But your second location, was that to ex uh, expand your uh, core operating capacity in the area or was it to open up a new geographic market? So when we first started, we were renting at a commissary. So basically it was just to get the heck out of the commissary was the goal to get our first location so we had our own thing. And so we looked everywhere. We looked for a year. We looked at tons of like even Papa Gino's that had gone out of business to be able to remodel. Um, there's a fake burrito place that's on Korea in Weymouth that was used in a Mark Wahlberg movie that we didn't know it wasn't a kitchen. So we literally looked at everything. <laughs> Um, and then we happened to find this place in Duxbury that was the old coastal cafe. We're down on Tremont Street. Um, and it is awesome. We renovated it to our liking. We have a huge open prep room where everyone has their own prep table and utensils and cutting boards and everything. Um, and then the kitchen in the back. And so for us, it was to service some clients we already had. Um, and also to start expanding into a new market. But ideally now we didn't have one client in Situate, Marshfield, Duxbury, Nobody. We were all Hingham Cohasset. Now, since we've been open, we bought the kitchen a little over a year ago. We have a whole delivery route that's committed already just to Marshfield, Situate, and Duxbury, and it's growing for fall already. So I think that we'll be able to keep this location focused on that area, maybe including, you know, a little bit farther south. And I would love to start looking, you know, up here, maybe in the Weymouth, um, Hingham, Quincy area for something that could service the areas up here so that we're able to expand this direction too. It's hard to do it all from one location and cover the entire South Shore. All right. Well, the, the square below you on your screen, Jay Nuss, he's there. He'll, he'll get you I anything. You wanted. Wanted. <laughs> um, Annie, uh, uh, KLP and ability to uh, uh, expand and scale the business model you've got now. Uh, Yes, so um, we are working on that every day um, because we're still very early days in our business. Um, we started out actually in Situate only, Situate and Marshfield. My sister and I, we grew up in Situate and we both actually now live again in Situate. And um, uh, it started off with just friends and uh, family ordering from us. Um, we would bring our truck to uh, the St. Mary's parking lot in Situate and have people pick up their orders. Um, we outgrew that within the first couple of weeks. So we shifted to have everyone come to Rockland to do curbside pickup. We still deliver to people in Situate and Marshfield um, when they need us to. We certainly are very flexible around that. So we're still trying to grow our core customer base um, but have expanded into Hanover, Norwell, Rockland, Braintree, Weymouth, um, Duxbury, Cohasset. So we're, we're covering a lot of other towns beyond from where we started just a couple of months ago. Um, we've got our hands full with that. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we would do another location or take on another geography. Um, we're still in those early days of just trying to figure out. Um, and also, uh, to echo Courtney, we are debt free as well. We've done this all um, on our own. So, uh, and that is the model we want to continue to have. So it's interesting with the um, pandemic relief for business, the, the PPP and then the uh, CARES Act uh, program. Um, I think the government felt this was going to be a lifeline uh, for most businesses and we were hearing from a lot of small businesses that uh, and some of them were startups saying they uh, were not going to look at any of the loans because they weren't sure that it was worth getting through this year only to uh, be saddled with debt they couldn't carry next year a lot of our bankers were telling us that they were um, having uh, uh, you know come to God moments with their clients that it wasn't worth taking these loans. Did you look at the loans at all or just uh, uh, 
just move them out to begin with because your business model was no debt? Um, so we actually, you know, I say right now we're 100% debt free. We took a PPP loan. Our, in the hopes that we don't have to pay it back, we used it only for payroll. So as far as we've been advised, we shouldn't. So you did, you got, you got to lean in again, Courtney. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. So you, you did do a PPP? Yeah, we okay. did it to cover uh, for the time that we were closed. We paid our staff. Um, and then we were able to bring, not everybody was comfortable coming back right away, um, especially those that had family members with, you know, compromised immune systems. We also wanted to honor the distancing in the kitchen. So we didn't bring everyone back physically right away, but we brought everyone back to the payroll. So we did that for our staff. Hopefully we won't have to pay it back. You know, our advisors have been telling us because we used it only for payroll, it looks good. However, we were also advised that if we do have to pay it back, you know, the interest on it is so low that at this point, it was a smart decision to be able to do that if that was worth it to us to be able to take care of our staff members, which it was. So we'll see, you know, we were still operating. So for us, we're, we're able to cover it. If we have to pay it back, it's, um, that's fine. Um, but it got us through those couple of weeks, it really more than a couple of weeks, really a couple of months um, of being able to bring back full staff so that they didn't have to worry. Annie? We, we looked at them for a, at a very quick glance and decided um, that it would it be in our interest to not use them. Um, the PPP in particular had parameters around it that were not going to help us um, in the way that we thought we, we, we would need the help. So we decided to just take the risk and, and just run it on our own and it's paid off. We've, we had a staff of six folks, we've brought back four um, of the six and the, the other two didn't come back of their own choice. So um, we are looking to perhaps bring in more, more staff members in the next couple of months as we get into the fall. It's a, it's, right now it's a week to week thing, but um, we opted not to take advantage of any of that. Good. And what do you both uh, quickly, because it's, it's 940 and other people going to want to get in on this, I think. But I'm curious, what are you seeing with um, food habits and eating habits? Uh, are there more people like me on the South Shore who are ballooning or are there uh, more people like uh, uh, everyone else I seem to run into who are out walking, staying fit and losing weight? Uh, well, just for us, for our clients, I mean, we, like I said, we saw about a third of our client base fall off for various reasons. Uh, some of those are already started to come back for the fall, but most of our clients continued throughout. And I think, you know, most of the feedback that we got was it felt really great to have some healthy food because making a salad is kind of an ordeal when you're making it for one person or two people. It's a lot of washing. It's a lot of chopping. It's really easy if it's already made for you in your fridge to make that choice. Um, so a lot of people have shared with us that because a lot of our clients are working from home or just at home more, that having, you know, our meals there has been a lifesaver to them. That said, I also, you know, we've got our um, team of editors and so we talk all the time and several of them own fitness locations, um, our personal trainers, you know, and they saw a decline immediately and now it's like coming back full circle for them with their clients wanting to do one-on-ones you know they're not comfortable going to the gym but they want to do one-on-ones like i feel like people are now starting to say okay that little snuggly hiatus time for a month at home was great and like over it you know so that people want to get out they want to start moving their bodies they want to start feeling better i think mental fatigue is taking toll on a lot of people too that you know we hear from from our clients and just other community members around town and so it's anything that you can do that just makes yourself feel better. Um, I think people are really starting to focus on that too, in whatever capacity that means. But I think we're going to start seeing more and more of that. Just me projecting out, we start taking our, um, we do seven week delivery sessions between six and eight weeks. This is all one is seven. And we ask people to sign up for the whole seven weeks. You only have to get delivery one day a week, but just try for seven consistent weeks just to infuse a little bit of extra nutrition, a little bit of clean eating into your daily, weekly habits, and just see if it makes you feel a little bit better. And so people sign up for seven weeks. We've already now seen, like, my fall is going to be huge. It's going to be crazy busy because I think people are just ready to start doing something that's self-care. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, one thing that we heard consistently is that food is a big deal right now. 
Um, and I think if we, one of the things that struck us at the beginning of, of this venture was the notion of food insecurity. And with things like Lysol wipes and other uh, supermarket shelves being emptied out, uh, fresh, fresh food was also top of mind in terms of what people were gonna be able to get access to. Um, so we don't, we don't feel like that's slowing down either. Um, the unknown has really fed that, I think, quite a bit. Um, and the, the whole thing about shaking off the, the cobwebs or getting out from underneath the fat suit is we are seeing that big time as well with the amount of, uh, produce, um, we are moving is it's incredible. So. And we already spoke yesterday about the fact that, you know, for our business models together and Heather did a great job of introducing us, um, you know, there's absolutely ways that Annie and I can work together to both increase our own client bases, but also be able to offer a more robust offering to our own clients that we currently have now. So I do think that we'll start seeing, and I'm already seeing it, I, I'm assuming that maybe you all are too, that um, community effort of, you know, instead of trying to be your own standalone, I'm playing in the sandbox by myself company, now it's the more we open that up and the more we work together, the more we're gonna help each other not only get through this, but come out ahead and be able to offer the community something awesome in the meantime too. Yes, so excited about that opportunity to work with Courtney and her team. Um, and it's funny because I, I was asking her yesterday about the herbs she was getting because we, we provide to Cats Aruba, so maybe she's already gotten some of our products. So that was kind of fun to learn. So super excited um, to just continue to grow and thank you for this opportunity to be with you guys this morning. It's so fun. So let me introduce uh, Heather McCall, who runs our Eat Sell Shore, and I'm going to call on Greg McDonald uh, as well. If you, uh, I don't know if you're driving or if you're able to speak, uh, but you're in the food industry as well. But Heather runs our uh, Eat Sell Shore Affinity Group, uh, which is it started out as a way to uh, promote the restaurants on the South Shore. We think food is an important part of local economy and economic activity. Uh, it helps brand the South Shore. And we've seen a lot of great uh, restaurants over the last uh, 15 years and, and that whole food industry coming uh, or growing on the South Shore. And she's done a great job and we're now obviously expanding it beyond just the, uh, the sit and dining experience. Uh, but Tell me about the food industry on the South Shore and uh, how Eat South Shore, the, the South Shore Chamber, can help promote that. Uh, uh, I think you just gave a great testimonial to the Chamber on uh, uh, connecting or how you two found each other or doing some stuff. And Greg, if you're on my, are you able to, to speak? Can you tell us a little bit about the restaurant group and what you're seeing? Sure. Um, we're, we're in Quincy. We are, um, we have a restaurant group, kind of a restaurant row. We're all in one block and we have six different restaurants. So we have everything from a fast casual food hall to a local neighborhood pub to a function facility to kind of a cafe bistro. Um, and it's a little different because even though we're multi-concept, we're all in one neighborhood as opposed to some multi-concepts there. They have, uh, Oh, you just muted. There you uh, go. Quite a bit. Um, I, we, we noticed a tremendous change on the, um, right away, like, you know, March 17th was like a spigot went off. And we saw like an overnight just collapse of, of all sorts of food service uh, operations around here. And then we've, we made a million decisions um, you know, I said to our team, I said, we're going to make a lot of decisions. We're going to have to make a lot of them fast. And, you know, we're going to get some right and we're going to get some wrong. And if we get them wrong, we'll just, we'll work and we'll try to fix it. So, um, we, we made uh, a lot of decisions where we are today is, uh, we haven't even opened up all our restaurants. We've opened up most, <clears throat> um, but we, you know, in terms of how we pivoted, we, we really have a kind of a special thing here where we have a delivery service where you can go on our website 
and with just a few clicks, you can mix and match all our menus and we deliver it to you to a real specific um, delivery zone that we create. It's not just a like a two mile radius circle. We can kind of customize a special map. And we had always done online ordering already. We just expanded into the, into the delivery. Uh, we have a, a $25 minimum and a $5 delivery fee, but it's been really, really well received. And we do it ourselves because one of the big issues if, if you read a lot of the trade magazines in the last uh, couple months has been the whole third party the uber eats doordash people whatnot um they have kind of a um a tortured relationship with restaurants and we really don't want to partner with those guys we really like controlling it ourselves and we uh, really you know basically control the product all the way through um you know, we, we're far from done <laughs> uh, and there's no finish line in the business for sure. So I think it's going to take, um, I think the next 90 days, just my humble analysis is you're going to see a lot of shakeout in the restaurant business because a lot of restaurants are out of their PPP money. So I think now you're going to see the next 90 days, how many people can kind of stand on their own model. Yep. And other uh, Inevitably, there are going to be some small businesses that go under when you have an economic shock like this. Uh, what do you think the outlook is, all three of you, for the food industry, whether that's the, the end product uh, consumables with sit-in dining or uh, growing, uh, manufacturing food in the area? What do you think the, uh, the outlook is for the South Shores food industry over the next few years? say I echo exactly what Greg just said which is I think we're going to start to see the next 90 days is probably exactly right um, just which small businesses in the food industry which restaurants um, restaurant groups you know who, who is able to sustain on their own two feet and with clients hopefully coming back and and with the support still happening um, I'm sure there's going to be changes I'm sure there's going to be changes in farms that may not be able to be sustainable after this, um, taking the hits that they've taken. So our local agriculture could look different. Uh, farmers markets for sure have taken a huge hit and all the little businesses, all the small businesses that participate in those. I mean, Greg, restaurants and, and restaurant groups, like God bless you, it's been it's one challenge after another, like every day is something different. So those that can stay strong and navigate through all of this, um, I'm sure there's going to become a little bit of a smaller group, unfortunately, and then it's going to be those rebuilding times to to get back up. And I'm just hoping, I'm hoping I'm in the group that's still standing, and Annie and Greg and all of my friends, and that we're able to just become a rock that has made it through these times to be able to help new enterprises and new chefs and new folks entering the food industry um, to get established. Um, I know we're certainly here for that, and you know, hopefully. We won't see too much change, but I'm sure it's inevitable. Yeah, I think that food is so important. Everybody needs to eat. And this marketplace is shifting a lot. Um, I referenced um, that I'm part of a podcast company and we have one of my friends who's a celebrity chef. We're doing a show with her uh, called Tanya's Kitchen. It's Tanya, it's Tanya Holland. She was one of the first Food Network chefs. and. Through that, I was introduced to DoorDash last week. And they, one thing that I'm hopeful of is technology may help pull us out of this and who knows in what shape or form, but DoorDash is aggressively creating a business unit around local independent operators. And um, they haven't totally formally announced it yet, but they are, they have case studies where they've got, you know, people with a very high percentage, over 70% of their business, they've, they've gotten through the DoorDash relationship. So uh, I'm not saying they're perfect. I understand them want to control end to end, um, but I'm hopeful that in times like this, we can find new ways to do things and sustain and become better. So um, it sounds a little Pollyanna-ish right now um, because it seems really tough and bleak but um, working together as a local community is, I think, the key um, for us to link arms and stay strong. 
So how can the chamber and Eat Cell Shore help um, help both of you or Greg and your restaurant uh, in the restaurant group? Um, how can we help promote the food industry and how do we help uh, individual entrepreneurs with their business model as we look at uh, coming out of this and uh, trying to improve the South Shore's reputation for food? That's a big question. That's a, there's a lot in there. I would just quickly say- About 10 minutes. How do we, I'll just, I just want to say one thing. It's about remaining relevant to the customers. So what are they looking for? What do they want? Um, how has their perception changed um, of being out and being in public places? And in particular, I worry for the, the restaurants as the weather gets colder. What, what is the plan B once people, we don't have that outside seating for folks? Um, so what, you know, what are people looking for? I think Heather's done an awesome job. I've been working with her a lot lately, and I think exactly what she's doing is what the chamber can be doing. Um, really trying to get out there. Social media, I think, Greg, I don't know how you feel, um, but I feel like social media has been huge for us. Maybe in the restaurants, I, I don't know. I know I look at my favorite restaurant social media posts all the time, and I'm totally uh, drawn to wanting to order, you know, based on specials that are being posted and, you know, photos of food that are being posted. And I think the more that, you know, East, East South Shore has been great, you know, so we joined last year. Um, I think it's been totally worth it. Not only just for promotional reasons, which again, I think Heather, you've done a great job doing that. Like sharing, you're always sharing our posts, sharing our stories. Um, and I really appreciate that. But also it's been awesome. And I can't even tell you how great it was during this whole shutdown time, and I know restaurants are still going through this, but I don't want to say that it's anywhere near over, um, but to have that group, like we were on a group chat during the month of March, April, May, I'm sure it's still there happening, um, but it was awesome to be able to like bounce ideas off of each other and just hear like, hey, you know, uh, whatever, Trident is doing this and help us promote this new menu that we have or you know whatever so we just we could all help support each other so i think bringing us all in the food industry together under one umbrella that's maybe you know segmented away from just general chamber like eat south shore is it's a great way for us all to support each other too and just to kind of see how we can continue to support each other so i think that's really important the more that we can do that just to form those little groups of collectives that are all doing the same thing and trying to bring the community similar things um, is awesome. And then also just that, I think the social media sharing, um, just helping to promote each other. It, it, it's weird because we do it a lot. We'll promote like other catering companies. We'll promote other restaurants, other food service people. It actually helps you too. You know, it's, you reach a whole different demographic of people when you're all just trying to, I'm, I'm exposing my clients to, you know, restaurant groups, but at the same time, when they're sharing and, you know, shouting us out and stuff too, it's exposing us to clients that might not have found us otherwise. So I really just, you know, I know I've said this multiple times this morning, but I think anything we can do as a community on the South Shore together, just to kind of help um, promote each other really at this point, I think knowledge is power for everyone. Not everyone knows about all of us. I didn't know Annie until Heather introduced us, you know, which is a shame. I should have known about you in April. Um, so I think the more that we can do that for each other, the better. So I would just say as much of that, keeping us connected and getting us out in front of the public that the chamber can help us do would be so much appreciated. That's great. We're gonna bring you in studio to take the testimonial and, um, uh, you know, get you on the board next I'll year. In more for that. <laughs> Great. Uh, you're, uh, you're bringing together uh, restaurants in the block or the strip there together, but uh, what, what can the regional business community and the chamber uh, do to promote the food industry more than, than we've been doing? And you're muted if you're trying to answer about that i think um the phone keeps going off all day yep. <laughs> already um i i think what courtney said is right in terms of the social media has been a big thing for for us um, but what i've noticed is 
you know, two, two real big things. And the restaurant really needs to create an environment where people feel safe coming in. And we've worked hard to try to create that in terms of rules and spacing and just the, the feel of a place. Um, that, that's really important for, for the restaurant. Um, the second part, I think, is, is a lot of restaurants were um, about the show and the scene. And a lot of that stuff's kind of gone right now. So a lot of it is the one-on-one -on -one re one -on -one relationship with the staff, with the customer. It kind of gets back to the basics a little bit. That's one, one thing I've noticed. Um, in terms of the chamber's assistance for that, it's, um, I think it's just complimentary. I, I, I think it's just confirming and profiling different operators that, that, you know, that are doing a good job and that are trying and, and creating, um, create, you know, trying to, trying to do the right things. And, it, and, it, and it's really going to be a, it's going to be a, a tough year for restaurants. It's going to be a tough year for a lot of industries. I mean, tons of industries, obviously. Everyone talks about restaurants all the time because everyone eats out all the time. But there's so many other retailers and, and just industries that it's almost hypocritical, some of the things they've had to do while other businesses can follow different rules. But um, I think for the chamber stamp standpoint, it's really just more of a supportive role. And um, I think some of these uh, sessions like what you're doing today are great. It's a good, it's a good help. Great. So Heather, you, you chatted a, uh, Heather Dwyer, you chatted a, uh, a, a testimonial, but not everyone can uh, see these chats. So uh, uh, unmute yourself and, and give your testimonial that you, you shouted out. Sure, happy to do it. Um, I'm Heather Dwyer, I work at Friendship Home in Norwell. And I've known Annie Powell and her sister Kathy for many, many years. Um, they're wonderful people, very invested in our community great friends of mine and um, just really dedicated businesswomen who love, love what they do and love to, you know, just make it better. I've been together with both of them throughout my life talking about work and what their passions are. And it does keep coming back to food for those guys. <laughs> and um, which is great because that, that's something I love too. But um, they have really worked for, I'd say, 20 years in one way or another um, with fresh herbs and um, with the restaurant business. And it was really interesting to see them develop this where they were sort of direct to the consumer. I think in a way, it seems like they're both very fulfilled by doing that and being able to make a change in people's lives right now. Um, my, for me personally, I have two daughters and you know, with COVID and everything else, I think we went through what everyone does. You don't want to, especially in the early days of this, didn't want to go out in shopping and just to avoid the hassle of it, frankly, and know that what you're going to get is, is good and it's not a waste of your time. Everything that we've ordered from them has been delicious and wonderful and they're so pleasant and it's just been, it's been great. I, I just highly recommend them and I love them. I think they're great. So, so here's the, the sad irony of this. You just gave a great testimony about how you've been a long-term customer and Annie just posted a discount for new customers. So you're not eligible. <laughs> oh, I, I'll figure out a way to get it from her. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good about doing things like that. <laughs> Annie, you want to you wanna shout out your, uh, your offer since not everyone can read these? Yeah, sure. So we normally have a cutoff on Mondays for folks to... Um, place their orders to um, get them either Wednesday or Thursday during the week. But we've extended the cutoff today until 1130. I know that doesn't give a lot of time, but um, I love this morning to have a Thursday, either delivery or pickup um, from us. So, and thank you, Heather, for the uh, shout out. I really appreciate it. Um, again, it's early days and we're still trying to grow every week. So thank you. And Courtney, yeah. thank you for the opportunity to work with you. I'm thrilled. Yeah, oh, super excited. Thank you. So we're we're at ten, but I wanted to sneak in uh, just sort of one last issue that you um, triggered, Courtney, when you were we were speaking. You were closed down for three weeks. What did you do for communications with your customers uh, and staying in touch? And I'm going to pivot to Annie because this is her business uh, and her profession on communication. Uh, to quick tips on 
how you communicate without becoming uh, just too noisy and in the way, because I've seen both models with this and it's very hard to get it right between staying in front of people, giving information and just becoming uh, white noise background because it's too much. But Courtney, what did you do during your three week hiatus or shutdown to stay in touch? So, well, for better or worse, we started a uh, CK one minute cooking show from my house. I did it. <laughs> and uh, it was awesome because it helped us stay connected to our clients. So we launched our CK recipe box. So I used Katie Sutton uh, KL designs in Hingham for my website. And so she and I would stay up literally that first week during shutdown to like three in the morning, just banging out recipes, getting them uploaded, building that recipe box. We had an arsenal already. It was just, I didn't have the time to transfer everything. Now, all of a sudden, when I'm not going to Duxbury every day, I've got all this time, right? So we got all of our recipes uploaded. And then every day for 10 days, we, st we did a one minute cooking show featuring a different recipe. Um, one day we did actually we partnered with stars and did their cucumber tomato salad and we did that so from my own kitchen one minute posted it on Instagram and then parlayed that into our Facebook or into our um, website page that we have them all archived on super amateur not professional but our clients loved it and they totally resonated with it we had so much fun interacting with everybody um, Asking them, like, when's the next one? What are you gonna make on the next one? What are you gonna wear on the next one? You know, so it really, we tried to highlight the little boutiques. We had like cloth and assemblies, you know, having us wear their outfits to show like, hey, you can go online and order these clothes. Anyway, so we tried to really stay connected to the community and our clients through personal interaction, which totally was out of my comfort zone to do it. But I mean, it was just no holds barred. We just did what we had to do. Um, so we got the recipe box up, tried to generate buzz with that. And then every day we post. So we'll post something about community, something about food, something about our pop-ups, or we try to do it every single day at the same time. Um, and you know, some posts obviously get more likes or follows, whatever, than others. But we really just try to stay in front of people and let them know, hey, good morning, we're here. Here's what's up for the day. Um, so I've backed off on, I don't have the time anymore to be doing one minute cooking shows that I'm not necessarily that great at, but it's bit, that was something for us that just helped keep us connected to everybody while everybody was in their home. That is and, awesome. Any a one minute professional uh, uh, summation of how do you get communications right um, in a pandemic? So, when everyone's yeah, it's so bizarre because it's just like Courtney said, it's um, trial and error and getting out of your comfort zone. Um, we've used Facebook a lot. Um, that's been our primary vehicle for people to find us in the community groups. Um, and, um, and, and of course I'm using constant contact to put out newsletters to tell a little bit more of the story um, and provide more context, but we're still very much a work in progress. And that one minute cooking show is a total inspiration to me. So kudos to you, that's awesome. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Stay tuned. We're going to start our own cooking show. We'll have Heather do a uh, two minute demo every week uh, to increase our traffic and uh, see how that goes. Annie, Courtney, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. So great. Joining everyone. Thank you.